Normally I start to meet with a few announcements and I'd, I'd like to turn that over at this point to Kristen and Adam Ricky, please. I'm on my way to the front. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, so the announcement that I'll be making, so this week is... A little louder. The louder. announcement I'm going to be making is, this week is Animal Control Officer Appreciation Week. So we've been celebrating... that Animal what? Control Officer oh, oh, Appreciation yes. Week. Yes, and so yesterday we had a luncheon where we actually pre presented a variety of awards out to the animal protection staff. And I wanted to make sure that they got recognized in front of you folks um, as well. So I'll light each one up one at a time. Um, we're going to start with Officer Chris Young. He was selected as our Officer of the Year. For those that don't know, he's part of our civil process unit. He handles barking dog, animal waste, records requests, and he handles a lot of the internal things when somebody shows up. He's the one that goes up the front and deals with a lot of different uh, aspects of what goes on with animal protection right here um, at the facility. And so he was recognized for his efforts all of last year. So in addition to that, um, our community support personnel person of the year is Cynthia Stella. For those that don't know, she's been overseeing the pet support since its uh, incarnation and she continued to lead that team and now she's also leading uh, the dispatch team as well. Uh, and so she's always out trying to help pets, whether it's here, whether it's out in the community, and also aiding uh, pet owners to get all the resources that they need to be successful. And next, we have Veronica Sanders. She was selected for our Life Saving Award, and this is, we look at an incident at some point in time during the last year where we really felt that an officer went above and beyond what they may or may not have done that really resulted in the um, a pet still being alive. Um, I won't go into too many details um, with that situation. You may know from uh, a headline, uh, she responded to a dog that was being physically assaulted by its owner. Um, she was able to find the dog, get it into her care, had a very short interaction with that pet owner um, and then ultimately two days later this same pet owner was found um, with her cat on the stove and ended up stabbing uh, the firefighter that responded to it and she was there actually saving that dog which we never would have known could have led to that that next situation and so she did a really good job in that response and making sure that that dog was safe And then we give up two meritorious service awards. So these are the uh, the folks that really come in every single day. They dig in, they do a job, and they, they do it to the to the highest standard. And so one of them is here, the other one's off today. Uh, the first one being Victor Villardi. <laughs> For those that don't know Victor, he is our uh, DOA driver, so he does all the deceased animal pickup. He drives all over the county. He's out there every single day. He's supposedly scheduled for an eight-hour shift. I don't know if he's ever worked one. Um, and so it's generally 10, 11 hours. He comes in. He is dedicated. He's committed um, to, to his job every single day. And for that, we applaud him. Um, and the other one that got the award was one of our dispatchers. Uh, his name's William Malmquist. And he's that he's our dispatcher who is just the same thing. Real hard worker, comes in every single day. He oversees our FRA um, situation, so he does all the rabies prep and all the paperwork and does all the communicating with the labs, make sure everything is getting done. So he was recognized as well. So those are the five things. Thank you. Um, and, and, and finally, um, you know, on the back side of the good positive news. Uh, a week ago, we actually lost a member of the Animal Protective Services uh, family. Uh, her name was Randy Crawford. She was one of our dispatchers, and she un unfortunately passed away very untimely. It was not expected. And so I know in this time, the Animal Protection is dealing with that loss um, as well. Thank you. I, you know, uh, I just wanted to make a comment. Back in the old days when we used to have volunteers uh, helping with intake, um, Victor <laughs> was the guy that would help me clean up the mess because I was totally freaked out when dead animals would come in in the back of somebody's car. <laughs> I had no idea what to do. 
and not only in that case, but many other cases, and not to overshadow the work of all the other people that I just mentioned. I just wanted to say that because Victor's always been a great help to me, and I appreciate it. With that, I'd like to announce uh, our employees of the month, but before I do, I want to let everyone know that we're going to have a volunteer appreciation party on April 22nd. Mm -hmm. Coming up, and it begins, uh, I guess it's at 12 p.m., does that sound right? Um, 12 to 3, and it's at the Crooked Tooth Brewery, which is at... Okay. <laughs> Sounds like Andrew's been there. There's a lot of appreciation uh, that can happen there. That's nice. uh, and it's at 226 East 6th Street. And please RSVP Gina Hansen at ginahansen at tima.gov. Let her know if you can make it so that they can make adequate plans for all people that may show up. So we have... Uh, Three volunteers that I would like to talk about today. I'm actually going to read a statement about each of them. Uh, and the first is a member of the PAC Act Committee, Christy Holliger. Uh, um, you know, Christy's kind of our uh, dog walker extraordinaire. Uh, she started the group and uh, is the leader of the Rough Runners group. Uh, and she's the PAC Act volunteer representative. Uh, she's been with PAC over four and a half years and has put in some 1,600 hours, probably more than that by now. Uh, and she's a huge, huge advocate for our pets and our volunteers, and uh, we really appreciate all the time that she puts in. Uh, and uh, give her all the love that she can. So she's really, her heart's all in it for the animals here at PAC. Volunteer of the month is uh, Mary Davis. Uh, is Mary here? Um, yeah, she's one of our most dedicated cat volunteers, and uh, she's been with Pat for almost three years, with perhaps, we're guessing, I guess, about 6,000 hours. Uh, Mary spends many days at Pat uh, working in cat medical, doing adoptions and everything else that we can think of. Uh, we're very lucky to have her, and she's kind of one of our volunteer uh, cat experts. And uh, so let's give it up for <laughs> And finally, uh, but not last, we have Wendy McFeely. Uh, Wendy started out as a dog walker and quickly realized more volunteers were needed to help with kittens or kitties. And she's been with us for a year and a half and has about 1,200 hours in already. Uh, she's been a great advocate for our cats and a huge help to Mary and staff. And she also does adoptions like a boss. Um, Wendy, we're thank thankful to have you. And she's also a foster mom, too. So thank you very much. monthly lifesaver award um, employee of the month um, for somebody in our staff and the, the staff nominate them um, and then us as a leadership team we get together and we vote on it um, and not only was Victor great um, in the APS awards but he got nominated as well <laughs> <laughs> Sticks and stones, I think. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Came with the con 32 years. Yeah. Oh. Kino Hospital. Oh, and you're retiring this year, right? Or next year? Mm -hmm. Mañana. Chairman, can I have a picture with them? Would you? Yeah, would you yeah, mind? Sure. And then I'd love to have all of our award. Would it be okay if we had all of our award winners come up and get a photo with you? Yeah, you're better. <laughs> Prettier, Barry. If everyone wants to get up, that's great too. Come on. Too, but come on. Let's get our award winners up there. Um, yeah, come on in, everybody. I'm taller. <laughs> 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 awesome. 
Thanks, you guys. Thank you. item we have today is adoption of the meeting minutes for March. Uh, I wasn't here, so are there any uh, comments or changes to the minutes from March 8th? I move we accept the minutes. Second. Uh, motion has been moved by Mr. Squire and seconded by... Actually, I seconded. Oh, by Pat Hubbard. That's right. Pat uh, All those in favor of said motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Okay, motion carries. So the minutes are adopted. Uh, call the audience. At this point, I have two uh, audience cards. You have three minutes to speak. The first is uh, Joanne. Uh, is it Gary or Kate? It's Jerry. G A R O Y. Gary. Where do you want to uh, You can sit. You can stand right next to the in person right there. Okay. Uh, okay. Just, okay. Uh, my name is Joanne Gary, and this is about betting. And uh, from the perspective of could, could you speak up? It's not okay, this is about bedding. Okay. From the perspective of massage therapy, okay. um, a lot of us go in and try to comfort the dogs that when they just come in, dogs that are really shut down, dogs that are traumatized, and we need to get on the floor. We need to get down to them. You can't help a dog when you're up here and they're down there, and we really need to get down. And I need blankets, or I need bedding. And, um, and I have to get down there too. So um, I'll tell you just a short incident. About four days ago, a little girl came in. Her name was Glory. Glory had been stunned by bees. And when I saw her, she was standing in her kennel and she was like immobile. She was just standing there like a statue. So she had no bedding. She had a bed, a kind of bed, but it was real small and she was big. So I went in and I just talked to her. I didn't touch her. I sat there on the cookie floor and talked to her. After about 45 minutes, 45 minutes, she finally turned her head and looked at me and put her paw in my leg. Okay, so then I ran and God found me a blanket. <laughs> I knew where to go. And I got a blanket and got in the bed with her and got her to at least sit down. And then I was able to rub her a little and do some massage and everything. And so then I left to do some other things, but I wanted to see what she would do. So when I came back, I peeked around the corner, and she was laying on that blanket, and she was sound asleep. And that's where a lot of massage people leave their dogs. It's asleep. They can't, you know, they have to have those blankets. They have to have that cuddling. And even a small dog, how do you cuddle it if you don't have a blanket and you're so traumatized? We deal with the mental health of these dogs. We deal with the mental health of them. And maybe I can get to a dog and it doesn't have to go into the decompression program. If that dog is left alone, it could just be crazy and go on and have to have more. That dog, oh, the other thing is, I came in the next day and she was gone. She was gone because she was happy again. Because I came back and she was just jumping up and down, sitting on my lap, and then the next day she was a doctor. But that's what you want. That's what we want. I cannot do that kind of work without some type of comforting tool, which for us is betting. And I'll tell you the other thing is, if there's a problem with money or time, people doing it, doing laundry, or money, I will use 10 pieces of bedding or however many, and I will come to the laundry room and I'll take 10 pieces of dirty laundry home and I will wash it. You will never know, you will have no cost to you, no time, I will do it. And I know a bunch of the other massage therapists that will do it too. We're desperate to have that value. So I really would appreciate it if you would uh, think about that for us, please. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next person that we have is uh, uh, Joe Wishney. Hi. Uh, my subject is also betting. Um, I found on the UC Davis Corette Shelter Medicine Program website some information regarding bedding as it respects animals in shelters. Uh, apparently in 2016, an architectural firm working on the design 
for a new shelter, I don't know who that was, um, wrote to them and said, we'd like to know um, your position on bedding because the people in this shelter are adamant about having bedding. And the answer was, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, I'll just give you a little bit. There's no doubt that it can enhance the welfare of some dogs while other dogs may be indifferent. Uh, regarding whether it spreads disease, uh, not any more than anything else, and dogs that haven't fouled or soiled their bedding should stay with their bedding, either until they're adopted or until the bedding is soiled. And even though uh, we provide Columbia beds, which is comfortable for the dogs, uh, they, without, without bedding, if they don't, they don't really allow dogs to nest, or have a very soft resting place if used without, without blankets. The ASB guidelines for standards of care do recommend guidelines for standards of care do recommend that shelters should make a soft resting place available for all animals to provide comfort and prevent pressure sores from developing. Some dogs do need extra bedding or hiding spots in addition to their raised bed, and, and which height case bedding and hiding places should be provided for scared and nervous dogs, arthritic dogs, those with mobility issues. I would default to providing each dog with some bedding until the dog shows a different preference. So the bedding uh, protocol, as has been communicated to us uh, just recently, is that the only animals that get blankets are cats, yay cats, clinic pets, dogs or puppies in the lobby, puppies in the puppy room. Those are the only animals that will get blankets. Uh, the next group, Seniors over seven, arthritic dogs, will get a yoga mat. Well, that's comfortable. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, co-housed dogs. We have many co-housed dogs. We're, we're pretty full. So you have a, uh, a kennel that only uh, contains one car on the bed, two dogs. Dog A gets a bed, dog B gets one of these. Oh. Uh, small dogs, multiple small dogs, and when we have really small dogs, three, four, five dogs, not unusual in the kennel, they fit just fine. But again, one bed, yoga mats. I, I believe, and I think many of us believe, that um, dogs that need it, senior dogs, arthritic dogs, co-housed dogs, should have one. I don't, I don't think this is appropriate. No. Unless you're doing yoga. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Um, call the audience. Okay. Um, director of communication. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Um, I have a lot of pieces for you today, so I'll try to move rather quickly. Um, just a couple of highlights from the animal services report this month. Um, we achieved a historically high 89% save rate this month. That's up five percentage points from the previous year. Um, what is not on here is that we also are looking at average length of stay going down, which is important. The average length of stay for a small dog in this building is about three and a half days. Um, the average length of stay overall is about 10 to 11. Um, and that's a number that, um, that we're always paying attention to because the less time animals spend in here, um, the better, no matter how much we work to make the shelter a um, great place to be. Um, we have had a busy spring sort of finishing out the organizational chart. and. You remember, I think it was my second meeting with you, I brought you an organizational chart, and I promised you that as it evolves, um, we would be bringing you um, the, the, copy, the chart as it shifted. And um, I'm proud to announce that last time I gave you this chart, of the top sort of four tiers, there were about 13 vacancies, and we have filled all of those. Um, 
We're now, we've now sort of moved down the chart. There were about half, uh, around half of the people that have moved up in the organization have been internal promotions, and about half have come from outside from other communities, and we think that's an important balance where um, using our local talent and also bringing in national experts. Um, one of those national experts is in the room with us today, and I just want to briefly introduce you to him. Um, Esteban, would you stand up Hello, really Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Esteban Rodriguez. It's a pleasure to meet you all, and uh, I'm looking forward to forging uh, long-lasting uh, relationships. Okay. Esteban, can you give us like the one-minute uh, Esteban resume? Because I think it's important. Yeah, I mean, I started back in uh, 1999 in El Paso, Texas, and uh, worked there as a field officer. Later on, I uh, worked in uh, the city of Dallas and uh, promoted up to a manager. And uh, the, that that situation there in Dallas was uh, was tough. I mean, I think it still is tough. But uh, we, I implemented different programs uh, for life saving and, and community engagement. Um, I have a passion for community engagement because I think that's the mindset that we have to change to be able to be productive members in life saving. I also uh, worked a while in San Antonio and I ended up in Austin. Finally had an opportunity to come here to Tucson, which is a great opportunity for me, not only to save lives, but it uh, does bring me closer to my family in El Paso, Texas. <laughs> Uh, so I'm happy to be here. I'm uh, I'm ready to work, and uh, you know if anybody has any questions, you can always reach me. Uh, I have uh, Esteban Dot. We'll make sure we get we get your communicate yeah. your your kind well, of information. Thank region. you for having me. Thank you. Where is he on this? Well, yeah. What's this? What he's you are a director of oh. external. He's the um, field and community services manager, external operations manager. He's overseeing everything that happens outside of PAC. And uh, you've had to hear me speak, and I'm sorry, um, ad nauseum, about the importance of human-animal partnerships. His key role, once we get some of this uh, strategic stuff done, is going, to, or some of this organizational stuff done, is going to be to build strategic partnerships um, with jails, with schools, with other community organizations. There are so many people in this community that want to be helping us and just don't know how yet. And so that's going to be a key component of Esteban's role. Um, it is important that he is Spanish speaking because he can help us get into parts of the community that we just simply haven't been able to reach yet. Um, so so uh, Esteban also brings that skill set, but he also brings a decade of leadership experience in some of the toughest shelters in the United States. Um, the picture on the report is that I put this on here, and that's uh, off of our investigator Sanders. Um, this dog, this is just a really quick story about the work being done here right now. But this dog was originally brought in by officers. The call came in December. The dog was rescued with an embedded collar. Do you all know what that is? Yeah. Um, and he, he was brought in and terrified. He was caught and he was just terrified. And he was brought in in a dog trap. If you've ever seen a cat trap, they look the exact same. As he was being taken out of the trap at Pac, he escaped. We set additional traps and tried to find him. And this is back in January and couldn't find him. And the officers were so upset. They, they talked about this dog and we, we did everything we could to canvas the area, try to find it, didn't find it. It ended up uh, more than a dozen miles from here. And we got a call that there was a dog under a trailer with an embedded collar that needed help. And our officers went straight out and they were able to catch this dog with a net and bring him in safely and he's now with us where he's getting the medical treatment he needs and he'll get a home. Um, the cool part about this story is that our officers, um, I was able to go out on a call with them a few months ago and I realized that our equipment was sorely outdated. It's probably more than uh, one to two decades old. We were able to work with risk management who provided us the funding to buy all new handling equipment for our officers. So they're, they're now using brand new catch poles, brand new nets, and all their equipment is top notch so that we can avoid that kind of loss in the future. Um, but that dog illustrates what's happening here. Less good news, pneumovirus isn't gone. Yeah. And you remember the uh, sort of, when I first started, we were really um, a bit panicked about how rapidly it was spreading. And even though we have isolation areas, those isolation areas are completely full. We're often co-housing dogs in those isolation areas, which is not ideal. Um, 
we're still working in consultation and um, I will propose to uh, Chairman Glaspie that next time we have Dr. Wilcox come and speak a little bit about the measures we're taking to prevent the spread of this disease. It kills dogs. And it doesn't just kill them, it kills them overnight. Often they go from having minimal symptoms to being dead the next morning, and that was what we were dealing with when I came on board. And so we are using an abundance of caution in this situation to keep it from spreading around the building, because the last thing we want in our new building is to have to continue to deal with pneumovirus. Um, it's rampant in the area. Um, we're also seeing a number of valley fever cases. Um, the usual things we see in spring, our clinic was treating 45 critical care patients in one day the other day. Um, so we are scrambling to save lives and it's that time of the year when it gets tougher and tougher. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that we have some guests here today who are not familiar faces you may have noticed. <laughs> One of the exciting things about the new PAC is we get to um, enable PAC to be a training center for the rest of the nation. And we have guests here from um, major U.S. cities as well as smaller communities. Um, they're here with us all week to learn about our foster programs and our overall operations at PAC. And this was all done through a grant. And the grant both pays for their expenses to come here, and it also gives us funding to help teach them. Um, we have people here from Indianapolis, Phoenix, El Paso, Chicago, New York City, and several other smaller communities, um, and probably other, Houston, other places, I'm, what? In Philadelphia, and some smaller places too. So they're, they've been here all week, um, and they wanted, they've had such an important experience that they wanted to stay late to come and see this meeting tonight and see the work that's being done here. So, welcome. welcome. Oh, I really want to mention. Is there anything on the director's report I didn't mention? Well, it's, it's a pleasure to have you all here. And um, if you have any questions in the Zoom meeting that you'd like to forward or comments uh, that you think we ought to hear, please, uh, I'll give you some time to do that. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda today is uh, under new business. Uh, Kristen and I, I wanted her to review the behavioral euthanasia protocol, which she just shared with the uh, volunteer group <coughs> at last month's volunteer meeting. And I thought it would be a good idea to do that again at PACAC. So if you would, please, Kristen. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the key items on my plate is, is developing not only a mission and vision. Remember, PAC just became its own department. Uh, not even 10 months ago. Um, but beyond that, we've got to develop standard operating procedures. And the place that we've started is with really critical issues. Um, and so our plan is to create a draft, uh, and we've already started this work, but to create a set of draft procedures that we can work with and pilot over at least a six month period. Because in trying things and piloting them, we're able to learn what works and what doesn't. And this procedure is a critical one because it's about life and death decisions based on behavior. Um, one of our key responsibilities we're tasked with is um, doing everything we can to keep people and animals safe. And that includes keeping the community safe from um, really unsafe dogs. Well, we had a situation where we euthanized um, a dog who was a volunteer and staff favorite. He had been at PAC for months, and he had become unsafe to handle by staff. He was um, unsafe when restrained. He'd gone to a couple of foster homes, had uh, varying experiences, but when we looked at the sum total of data, um, we not only decided to euthanize him, but we, made, we did not make him available for rescue due to what we felt was a safety risk base, primarily on one confinement issue, um, uh, one issue with the staff member restraining him. But, as always, communication bit us in the butt, and we did what I think is not a great job, um, communicating out why we made the decision and um, the timeline for the decision. And I, I felt really badly about that, because I think we were starting to build a more trusting relationship around life and death decisions um, with volunteers. And I stand by the decision. I think it, it was the right thing to do in this situation, given what I know. But the way we communicated, not giving a clear timeline, and not communicating this process up front really caused a, some disappointment in a lot of 
really hard feelings from volunteers. So what we decided to do was just to get everybody in the room and explain why we made the decision. Because we at least felt like we owed them that. Um, and, and to explain why we make decisions in general. Why are we making these behavioral euthanasia decisions? They're made about 400 times a year. Um, why are we making them? So what we did is it was, an, it was a one hour session. We focused less on that particular animal and more on the process that we're using. So I'm gonna give you the like really quick and dirty process and I'm happy to spend more time talking about this. The way we used to do it at PAC. Crystal, well, yes. if I interrupt, just a sec. If you, you should have a form that Mary gave you today. It's the adoption, it says mm -hmm. adoption criteria at the top. Mm -hmm. But in there, I believe it has the material that Crystal's referring to. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. The way we used to do this was to have sort of these lines in the sand that didn't really account for circumstances, and circumstances really matter. Um, I remember this one one case in Austin where a dog pretty severely bit an owner, um, and we that dog was slated for euthanasia, and we called the police who had found the dog and found out that the dog there had been reports of the person actually torturing the dog for months leading up to the incident, and that the guy had been assaulting the dog with a baseball bat at the time the dog retaliated changes the story, right? And so those circumstances are always really critical. And the other thing we found in Austin is that a lot of times we weren't even identifying the right dog. So we would have a case where there were maybe several dogs involved and someone said it was this dog, someone said it was another. And there were really no rights granted to animals whose lives were on the line. And we created a version of this policy back then to make sure that every dog got a fair shot. Because after all, a lot of these dogs are people's pets and they may have not just not have found them yet. We just don't know. Um, but we also knew that we had to have a process that, um, that would um, lead us towards euthanasia when, when appropriate. Um, the other caveat I want to make is that none of this is, means that these dogs necessarily need to die. They're not suffering. They're not animals that for their own good need to die. They are animals that either we don't have the resources to save we cannot hold indefinitely here at PAC when their behavior declines and they become less and less safe here, and we don't have an outlet for them. So these aren't animals that, that by necessity are you know, vicious Cujo type dogs. They're dogs that we just don't have an answer for yet. Why are we communicating this process with everyone? Because in communicating and in explaining to people, we'll help to find solutions for some of these dogs when we can do it safely. Maybe there's sanctuary placements where the dogs will live out their lives but not um, be able to be um, living in neighborhoods or maybe they're with trainers. Um, we just don't know until we try. So here's how we make the decisions now. Um, we look at criteria versus just having lines in the sand. We look at the specifics. So if a dog has bit a human, we look at the specifics of that. Minor biting is not an aberrant behavior for a dog. Dogs use their mouths like people use their hands. It's the way they communicate. So a very minor bite isn't an aberrant behavior. It doesn't mean that it's acceptable or after, um, depending on the circumstances, we can place the dog. But we're less concerned about those than moderate to severe bites to humans or animals. Um, one thing that would be really, if a dog bites another dog in its own home and they're fighting over food, that's different to us than if a dog jumps its fence, runs up and bites a jogger. Does that make sense? Yep. Because we're looking at, okay, what's the future possibility? Well, that's a lot less safe situation. We're much more likely to move straight towards euthanasia for that dog. But we look at, at circumstances for each case. We also have created a bite severity scale. This is based on input from national experts, including Dr. Amy Martyr of the Center for Shelter Dogs, um, several veterinarians, um, our, a, a county, two county attorneys, um, and a lot of different stakeholders and we created it there's no perfect bite scale the one that's used most frequently is called the dunbar scale but it's based on the depth of the bite in measurement like if it's a quarter inch bite it's less severe than a three quarters inch bite and that doesn't have any practical use value for us we don't have a way to measure the depth of bites of the dog so we created this this is a practical bite scale to measure severity Flipping over to the actual form, before we euthanize any dog here for behavior, uh, we are filling out this form. And so we're, we're writing down the identifying information because we want to make sure we have the right darn dog. In the old days, and some of you remember this, dogs would probably get misidentified. You would have the wrong dog in the shelter that would get euthanized. 
want to make sure we have the right dog, and then we, we take a series of actions. We want to do a simple medical evaluation just to make sure the dog doesn't have a broken tooth um, or something else that is, uh, that is causing it pain. There was a dog in another community that um, bit a child grabbed its hips and it bit the child. That ended up in this very lengthy court case. The dog was sentenced to death and then saved um, by the court case was turned over. But in the end, they found out that this three-year-old dog had early onset, extremely painful hip dysplasia. So it made sense that when its hips were grabbed that it turned around and bit. We also contact the owners. Um, we tell people if their animals are gonna die here. We have a responsibility to the public, but we don't have a responsibility to keep things a secret from them. And so we let people know if their animals are at risk. And a lot of the time, they will start to problem solve when you do that. And that's when our pet support center can step in and say, we can help you find training support. We can help you get a crate so that you can keep the dog contained. Um, and so we empower people to help find solutions for themselves. We also, in some cases, issue a plea to fosters and volunteers for help. In some cases, we will not choose that. In this case of this dog, we did not plead to fosters and volunteers to help us find placement because we didn't believe finding placement was the safe thing to do. Um, and in the end of the day, that's I'm the buck stops here person, and that's the call I have to make. And there will always be disagreement over those decisions, and I and I hear that um, disagreement. What we want to commit to is a process so that people know it wasn't willy nilly, random. Um, Tristan didn't like this dog, or Sarah didn't like this dog, so we euthanized it. Um, we we will notify volunteers, and what we committed to at the meeting was a 72-hour notification. And if we're giving them the opportunity to find placement, we will extend that time if we are able to, if they have a possible placement. Um, we also will plead our rescues. Again, in certain cases, we will not. Uh, we don't have a lot of behavioral rescue partners here, um, and we try to be we try to make good decisions about what animals we ask them for help with. Um, and lastly, we confirm the incident notes, and this is where we're asking for help for, for help from volunteers because we need more people helping us confirm incident notes. And we're also not euthanizing based on an in-shelter temperament test because we know through science and research now, which I shared with you previously, that behavioral assessments are non-predictive of future behavior. Um, and so the, our assessment process here is medical handling, general walking, handling, can it be vaccinated? Um, we also want to know, is it good in play group? Is it good with other dogs in a real life setting? Um, can it be handled by a person around other dogs? Um, can it be gotten in and out of the kennel easily? And so we're moving towards um, a continual evaluation process, and that's why we're encouraging our volunteers to enter notes as well, so that we can track the dog through its time in our system, not in one snapshot in time, which is not predictive. And then we're, we're having a reason um, for euthanasia for all dogs, so we're going to tell people why the reason was ultimately made. Um, and then the form has to be completed by a person, signed off by a manager, and then it has to be signed off by myself or Sarah, so that Sarah and I are aware of every dog dying for behavioral reasons. And so why I'm sharing this with you all, and we share it with the volunteers, is that we will disagree over decisions. That is going to happen but we are committed to following this process. And we're gonna be piloting this version for the next several months to see if it's working, um, and then following up and seeing what adjustments need to be made. Um, I have some comments. Are there any comments from the rest of the committee? I'll start then. Go ahead. Um, so moving forward then, and I, I fully appreciate your comments about why you're sharing this with everyone. Um, Given that this is going to be a living, breathing document that we're going to try to improve over time, mm -hmm. I guess my question is, how do we, or what methods have we set up to actually know the people that are interacting with the dog or cat that may be on this euthanasia list, watch, right? So that we can gather the information, you know, in each of these cases over this test period of whatever it may be, six months, so that you can go back and reevaluate if you want to change this form. It's one thing to just have it, but if nobody knows where to put their input in or how to feed into the process, I'm not sure that we'll really gather the information and we need to make that change. So that's my question. How do we, how do we implement this? And, and yeah. We talked about this at the meeting. We need volunteers to start using the shelter software system. And I say that fully recognizing that this shelter <coughs> software system makes that really hard. Um, and because you have to do it at PAC, and our volunteers are busy um, handling animals. 
We have um, an amazing volunteer, Jody Nelson, um, has agreed to step up and help us form what we're calling, um, I don't know if we have a name for it yet, but it is a sort of the risk level dogs. We're going to get ahead of the problem and form a proactive group of people working with those dogs so we know they're at risk before we get to this point. We're also creating an email group for people that want to know because a lot of the back and forth on social media, we have a lot of volunteers that don't want to think about animals dying. And for them, they felt really uncomfortable on social media pages when there's discussion of that. And so we're going to create a special group that I will also be in, Sarah will be in, and our leadership team will be in. That group will inform people about animals that are becoming at risk. In my last community, we had um, two lists. One was called attention and one was called high risk attention. And so we're moving towards a tiered system. Um, and the orange dot group is the really most, the key proactive part of that. And we just met with volunteers um, two months ago to say, please, 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 someone help us start this group because that's where we'll start to get to these dogs before they become truly unsafe in the shelter. Okay, I guess where I was going was I don't think that all the volunteers, uh, and most of the volunteers, I guess would be a better way to say it, really know how to use the system well enough or mm -hmm. it's not that available to them, they haven't yeah. come to pack. If we could just even find a way that people could write comments down on a piece of paper and give them to someone that can accumulate them in a particular case, that's going to be helpful as well. So Barry, when you're talking about comments, are you referring to comments made by somebody who's doing the volunteering to assist in the investigation process or, or they're, they're, just well, how they feel about it? No, I, tell, tell me if I'm wrong. There's usually going to be a group of uh, hardcore staff and volunteers that are that know these animals that are on the short list. So Got speak, it. Okay. And they're interacting with them because okay. they're trying to improve the situation. Okay. We definitely want to make sure that all of those people have their feedback recorded so okay, that over time we try to figure out a way if, if there's anything we can do to make That is a fairly limited scope of people based on yeah. liability issues surrounding those animals, correct? With the right training and that kind of thing? has to be. I would, if I was your attorney, it's I would be happy if it wasn't. Level three yeah, okay, okay, that's what I was trying to understand. And again, yes. a little bit of novice around this piece of this. I don't know much about this part of the of, of the animal care component yeah. with regard to these challenging behavioral issues. I mean, I get it, the goal is to get as many saved as we can, yeah. but then we also have the reverse, having worked in council offices where we run into this, um, I have dealt with the animals returned to society that then take out a kid. So, um, you know, the, those are those are real issues that you all have to deal with and address. And um, so I I hear you, absolutely, and, and so I hear what you're saying is making sure that process is defined. I would, I would say, though, thrilled to see that we have an SOP for it, right, and define criteria and statistics because historically that did not exist. And therefore there is great consternation in the volunteer community and, and the really, you know, save every animal community. Valid consternation when animals are put down without justification, yeah. potentially. So that's a real problem. But at the same time, you cannot have that dog that leaps over the fence to attack the jogger um, continue that behavior. That's that's a dangerous, dangerous circumstance. So I think you're doing the best you can to deal with that. There will always be differences of opinion on that. But I really thank you for putting together an SOP. That's a big deal for the city. I know it's a big deal for the liability issues around that. Also a big deal for protecting public safety as well. They don't want to go out have to take down an animal or uh, yeah. or, or get attacked by one, either way. Thank you. Yep. Just one correction, it's not an SOP yet. Not yet. We're still it's a draft SOP. Thank you. It's, yes. It's going in yes, direction. sir. We got to keep on top of it. Thank you. You're right. Thanks, Barry. No, you're right. Uh, Christy. Um, just in response to one thing you said, we do have a process right now that Hamden, our behavior is put in place uh, for those of us. And in, in we are talking about a small group of dogs yeah. typically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so um, we have a, a behavioral. So if we experience different type of behavior, whether it's good or bad, this dog's improving and maybe can be downgraded to a medium level, or this dog is um, just having difficulty getting in and out of the kennel, but it's fine. Okay. Any, any kind of notes like that can be put in the behavior log. Um, and um, Or uh, we're also heard to email Hampton and her behavior group um, if we have notes that we can't, you know. Again, because it's a small group of dogs, um, we're not, you know, she's not getting hundreds of emails a day. So um, there are ways to quickly communicate uh, issues or uh, concerns uh, to the behavior group so that, you know, something you need to put a behavior lock on an animal or something like that, um, that is in place. Mm -hmm. so, which is helpful for me when I, you know, get out of here late at night and I don't have time to. Mm -hmm. 
That's great. Well, I would, just to follow on Andrew's comments, I would just uh, I would just advocate that your team that's that's actually involved in each of these decisions uh, make sure that they fill out this information, mm -hmm. or if it's not appropriate in a specific case, they note that right. for risk assessment purposes, Please. moving down the road for our, our liability, you know, uh, cases and all of that that we have on the record that we properly evaluated. Yeah, One I just want to be really clear that, think, yeah, thanks for saying that. And the only, the major liability, what people get sued for successfully is non-disclosure. Right. And so we are really committed to making sure that adopters of any animal receive full medical and behavioral disclosure. And um, that's a, that is a challenge we're working through because as we create documents, um, they become public record and they're important to disclose to adopters and so we're also training our staff and volunteers to be descriptive not prescriptive so we're just asking them to describe what they're seeing not making overall judgments so for example we don't want anyone saying this dog is good with kids that's a huge liability issue um, it doesn't really mean anything so instead we're saying this dog has lived successfully with children in a home um, so we're really working on making some of those changes because um, as Mr. Squire said it is this is the diciest part of the work we do. These decisions are really tough because we are always balancing risk versus reward. Um, and um, so we are, uh, We are, I appreciate everyone's feedback about tightening up this process um, because it does need to be tight. We do need to make sure people really understand whether it's medical or behavioral, what they're getting into. Yeah. Yeah, I, I recently started working with these orange dot dogs who are sometimes falling into this category. And we have forced, we have the little thing to put on top of the kennel, what the dog can do and all. But if, if you could work on a, since not everybody's good with chameleon or doesn't have time to do chameleon here, which is the, on, the online program, and we can't do it from home. If you could work a flow sheet out that we could mark down what the in, in an objective manner what the dog is doing, how the dog is doing, mm -hmm. so that specifically for these questionable dogs, so that we have we could do that while, right after we take the dog out mm -hmm. or after we work with the dog, and then it could later get put on chameleon. I know we're worried about everything going on chameleon because then it becomes a document. And these things become documents too. Yeah. But if you have it written down, we can think about it, even if we're writing it at home, mm -hmm. and then bring it in the next day. So if you could make some kind of sheet that we could work on before we put it into the computer. That's a great idea. Any other comments or suggestions? I'm sorry. I can't take comments from the public right now. I'm sorry. Chairman. I, I'm watching poor um, Marty Claus sit over there from facilities management. Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> he's like, he's, he, he, he's he, he has to listen to me talk more than anyone. So, um, How long do you have today, Marty? As long as you need. Huh? As long as you need. How long is the presentation? Oh, how long do I need for that? Uh, 10 minutes. 15 minutes? Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, we just have a lot of money. You can give us the. Okay, I'm going to move on. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and go with the next item B, and then I might jump to uh, Marty after that. Um, because we had a lot of concern in the, in the uh, audience today about Betty. So, item B on the move uh, was requested by committee member uh, <coughs> Christy Hollander. So, Christy, if you would please uh, coordinate the issues on this. Mr. Chair, members of the um, I want to talk about the comfort of our dog housing. Um, on March 23rd, a memo was sent by the director discontinuing the use of bedding in dog kennels, and a large supply of bedding was removed from the shelter. Bedding has been provided through donations from the public at no cost to pack for many years to provide comfort for our pets. Um, dogs are provided one corundal bed per kennel. Corundal beds can be sanitized, they can provide comfort, and are raised from the floor but they are not soft and they provide no ability to nest. Uh, many dogs urinate on them as an alternative to their floor space, especially if they can't access the outside part of their kennels. However, many of our kennels house more than one dog, and that leaves one or more sleeping on the concrete. Our most vulnerable dogs, which are aged, arthritic, injured, frightened, uh, they need something soft to lay on. Two weeks uh, 
after this announcement, we have been instructed to use yoga mats as an alternative to blankets for the exception pets that are noted above. After three days, we've only had three days of the yoga mats um, and a very limited supply of them. I think we started with 10. We maybe have more now, but I don't know if they're in circulation yet. Uh, we just don't have much data yet. Uh, I've seen some being chewed up. Um, I've seen some just being ignored and, and they kind of wrinkle up and push under the front of the kennels. Uh, and I still have a lot of questions about the ability to clean, dry, and sanitize them adequately. The bedding supply is low. We don't have any blankets or towels uh, to spare to continue to support the population of dogs who need them the most. The cats actually are starting to experience a shortage now as well. The volunteers are hesitant to solicit donations uh, as they usually do because of the likelihood that the bedding will not be accepted or kept under the new policy. There are many publications from highly respected sources supporting the use of bedding for comfort, warmth, enrichment, a place to nest, and a familiar scent. We don't have the resources to provide it to all pets because laundering has always been an operational issue, but we try to supply our most vulnerable dogs, and of course cats and our clinic animals. Uh, bedding was believed to be a fomite for disease when laundry was being washed improperly by inmates. If you, may, you may remember when uh, Dr. Wilcox presented um, on the first um, big uh, outbreak that we had. Um, laundry was a, an issue. We had water turned off to our washing machines at some point during washing. Um, and we have discontinued the use of bedding at some times during disease outbreaks, but there are recommendations for correct laundry. There are varying opinions on the subject, but my research finds no actual data that supports bedding when laundered properly is any more risk for spread of disease than many of the other fomites that the dogs are exposed to daily. Um, volunteers, we walk them, we use leashes, we touch them regardless of how many times we wash our hands. I watch the public go down and touch every single dog's nose, and, and as um, the director stated earlier, we have. Um, we have dogs being treated in the main kennels because our isolation areas are full. So you've got sick dogs being touched, you know, and then playing, you know, healthy dogs. Um, respected sources including ASB guidelines for standards of care by the Association of Shelter Veterinarians and UC Davis Perret Shelter Medicine recommend the use of bedding to improve the welfare of shelter pets. The new shelter was designed with the assumption of shorter length of stay for dogs and flow through adoption. This is not a reality for many of our pets. Uh, 10 to 11 days is great, and I have no problem with those dogs. Don't get bedding for most of the time that they're here. Uh, but we have dogs that have been here for six months. Now, in fact, so the ones who need bedding the most are the ones that are staying longer due to health issues, age, shyness, depression, or deteriorating kennel behavior. Providing <coughs> bedding to them does not take away from getting them adopted faster. If anything, the comfort and enrichment of a familiar soft blanket will only improve the welfare, their welfare and adoptability. It's very common to see a stressed out dog lay on the smallest piece of fabric that you put in their kennel. If you walk into a kennel at night and the dog is pacing and doing circles and you go put in a blanket in its kennel, it will find that tiny little blanket on the, the coldest corner of the floor and that's where it will lay and it will fall asleep. So there's some things to consider. Our phase two, last I checked, is slated to have two more industrial sets of washers, washer and dryers installed. I don't know if that's changed, but um, that tells me that we anticipated continuing to have bedding. Uh, recently, the Board of Supervisors approved a significant increase for the cleaning contract that was expected to cover additional costs relating to the new shelter or, or whatever we had underfunded previously. This contract covers cleaning, feeding, and laundry. It doesn't break it down into any great detail. The new panels are designed with indoor and outdoor enclosures so the dog can eliminate away from their living and eating area. However, there are many hours a day, even after cleaning, that the outside access is closed off. This means, uh, this leaves most dogs in a four by five foot space for 15 to 18 hours a day, and that includes sleeping at night, of course. Um, we have panels with uh, two 80 pound dogs in them living in that small space for the majority of their day quite a few of them actually. <laughs> These kennels are not designed or recommended for two dogs, especially two who did not come in together. Um, but because of our population, we are forced to house two, four, sometimes six to seven little dogs 
in a single kennel where access to the outside half of the kennel is restricted for many hours a day. A single parental bed cannot accommodate this many dogs, therefore many are left to sleep on the concrete floor. I am asking the administration if they would be willing to open a dialogue to problem solve the laundry challenges. I know that we have them, I know that operationally it is a nightmare to get through this laundry. But to try to find, to find a way to continue to provide bedding to our most vulnerable pets, as well as discuss the schedule of when the dogs will have access to the outside compartment of their kennels. As summer gets near, it is, it's going to get hotter and they're going to have less and less access to the outside of their kennel. Um, but I believe that we can work together to find alternatives to the challenges we face with these issues and I hope that we can have a dialogue to do that. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I have a question for Kristen. Um, what what um, we just heard was that these animals are being shut in for a long period of time. I don't understand that. I mean, I've cleaned enough kennels in my life to you know you, you shut them in, you clean the outside, and then you shut them outside and clean the inside. So why would it be in there so long? Um, just a question. I, I'd like Marty, to, if, if it's okay with you, Marty, we're dealing with, this is a facility act issue actually, and it's more appropriate for him to respond oh. to that during his talk about the new shelter. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. Because it's I'm certainly, we all, we all acknowledge it's a, there's a temperature control issue that we're trying to address, but um, Christy and I are certainly on the same page that the guillotine doors need to be open almost all the time. Um, and so Marty and I are working on a solution to that. So, but he'll talk a little bit about that when he speaks. Chairman, what is our, what are we trying to do here now? What Christy had said was, I want to open a dialogue. What is our role right now besides educational and well, that, uh, my comment is this, this is an issue now at PAC um, and um, what I would like to know is uh, if we have a policy against using bedding, why? And well, what, what is our policy? There's been some stuff released from Sarah about what our current policy is. Uh, I testified in front of the Board of Supervisors a few months, maybe three months back, on the new contract for Central Pet. So if it is a money issue, I would like to know that, because I would like to know, you know where we're running into issues with money. If it's a contamination or fomite issue, I'd also like to know that. I haven't received or seen any letter from our medical staff uh, stating that at this point. So I don't know if that's the issue. So that's where I would like to start. And I would, if, if we don't want to go into all of that today, I would suggest that we make a motion to have maybe a subcommittee of this group with member staff, whoever Kristen decides, and uh, maybe a key volunteer or something to sit down and hash this out and figure out what we want to do with it. Uh, because it's a continual nagging problem that I don't feel is healthy for the organization to continue to do with. Okay. Well, I'm torn two ways on this because I, I don't think everybody knows, but I uh, worked for the Humane Society of Southern Arizona for 27 years as a director, and I started out cleaning kennels. So it was my job, basically, to make sure that these kennels were clean, and we never, ever, ever used a blanket. Uh, of course, back then, we, unfortunately, we were taking in 27,000 animals a year, and we were having to euthanize a, a large portion of those. But I understand that Corette possibly says that that is not a fomite. But my experience is, is that it is. Having bedding in a, in a kennel is not good for the animals. I mean, I know it's not good for them, maybe this, the ones with arthritis and that are ill to sleep on the concrete. But the fact of the matter is, is the disease that they deal with in this facility, we have to do everything we can to stop it. Dr. Smith. Well, maybe it's just a comment. If the dog is not sick, the dog does not defecate or pee on its blanket. The blanket is a, you know, it has its smell and it's something that becomes very comforting to it. And I don't think that, the, I, I know the issue is washing these things day in, day out. But if the dog is using his blanket as, on his bed, as something for comfort and it's clean, and it's just been laying on the same blanket and it's only the same two dogs in there. There's no disease in there that are going to be spreading back and forth. Kristen, hold your paper. 
that they're not going to spread. Again. That they're not going to spread by us using our sleep needs because we can hope we don't have to be dressed for them anymore. So I kind of so that so those those blankets and that bedding doesn't need to be washed every day. I don't wash my dog's blanket every day. And I don't. So I don't. I think that's no. one way of saving. If it's fuzzy and the laundry issue is one thing. I also want to say that the yoga mat that you brought in as an example is a very thin yoga mat. I found 10 millimeter yoga mats that are really nice and cushy. Even if we use a yoga mat with a towel on top of it, especially with the arthritic dogs, it would give them a lot of support and be comfortable and as a way to work out a compromise. But I, I agree, these little tiny thin yoga mats are not worth it, but there are nice thick yoga mats out there. Well, I don't, I don't think we're going to saw What's the details of any of this today, okay. but, and I hear what, what the Chairman Hubbard was saying, um, but I would like to know, uh, you know, what our position is, whether it's we really feel it's a disease issue, whether we, it's a funding issue, that's within the purview of this committee, and I think that we should make a statement on that, but we need to know the facts, and we need to get to the bottom of it, so Kristen. We can say really briefly a couple of things. Yeah. One, we were spending 50 staff hours a week doing laundry. If any of you remember what it was like when the inmates cleaned, I don't, but I've heard some pretty rough stories. And we're spending a significantly higher amount of money and we are right at the top. And I cannot go over that contract. So decisions have to be made from my end, minding the house, of being at the very top of a contract, spending more than we've ever spent by quite a lot, Decisions have to be made about what services get provided, and I am not, I made a judgment call that I am not okay with our kennels going unclean from one morning to the next morning. That spot cleaning in the afternoon is critical to the care of the animals. So there is a budgetary component to this. I also want to say, I feel like the Grinch that took all the blankets away. <laughs> um, I also want to say, like, I think that we, the other reason that this decision was made is because Dr. Wilcox requested it. Um, Dr. Wilcox does feel that because of pneumovirus, because of this deadly illness in the building that has been in the building now for more than a year, that we have to be extraordinarily cautious and take every measure to prevent disease. And, and, um, and Ms. Holger is correct in that there's many other ways we could be doing better. We could be ensuring that people aren't walking from dog to dog to dog, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be careful on this front too. I don't disagree that some of the dogs should have bedding. Um, we, we had an out of control problem and we tried to scale back my, my second month here, we asked people to scale back and it would happen until someone, and I don't, staff, volunteer, whoever would come in and give everybody bedding, we'd be back to the 50 hours a week. Um, and so I recognize that this was not an insignificant change. And the yoga mats, I'm just like kicking myself over this. So in my last community, yoga mats were a really key part of what we did because we had so many dogs falling on these slippery floors. And we still have that. The old dogs that get down, they can't get back up. The yoga mats, my intention for them was always that they would be given to older dogs so they don't get slipping on the floor and get that slate light thing. I do not believe they are a great bedding either. We're all on the same page on that. I think we do have a lot of work to go, and I'm asking, what I'm asking for is to, um, I try to, we try to do things in about 30 day increments to try them, see what works, and we're already in, the staff is running operations already in conversation about this issue and how we can improve it, and I think, um, I don't disagree with Ms. Hollinger that there's, there's a ways to go for the most vulnerable animals. I also think three days is the average length of stay for a little dog, and 10 days is the average length of stay for a big dog. We are not long-term housing animals, and I am also really sympathetic to her point that for those longer stay residents, offering them some comfort with a blanket is a reasonable thing to do. Yeah. Um, so this is not a life and death situation, which is why it has not been treated as such, but I do understand the importance of it, and of course I'm willing to continue the dialogue and to continue to try to get this right, but also make sure that all of a sudden not every kennel is full of a giant comforter. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Squire. So uh, I'll join you in Grinch status um, because I have to. So this is wearing my hat as the, the representative for the different organizations and government bodies that go to this. Um, Kristen is under a lot of pressure to keep the budget where it is. It is super high. 
Um, we're thrilled to see that staffing list where it is and, and done, but that's bigger than it's ever been officially. Um, but it's critical. So we have behavioralists now, we have a deputy director, we have legitimate people who have the animal expertise on board to do that. The city is willing to pay for those services, as is the town of Oro Valley, as is the remaining partners that we have. The, the betting issue, so we're going to argue every day, if, the, if a vet says there's a vector control issue or a potential vector spread, we'll back her 10,000% on that. On, on having a senior dog at home on a tile floor, um, I absolutely see the challenges and we, he chooses to sleep on the bed half the time, half the time he goes back on the tile floor, walks back to the bed, walks back and forth. He has the option, right? And, and that's the difference. I do think senior dogs, I think animals, just my perspective, would be where we need to do it, we do it. But, but I also see where you would have a problem with every three days having, and I, I saw the stack when I first came over here when you guys moved, of, of just it was a room loaded with linen. Um, and even then, there's contamination opportunity there because if it's not being kept in the right place or stored the right way, you're getting all kinds of other stuff on it. So I think a future conversation, a future item on this is you all work together. If there's a subcommittee, I'd be happy to be a part of that as well. I do think it's critical to, to take care of those longer term animals in a big way. I hear what you're saying, Doctor, with uh, especially cohabitating older animals that have been here for a while, um, to be able to have that same smell on their blanket every night, clearly that's a dog thing, right? They sniff their circle and go do their thing. So I get that, that's a comfort level. But I would agree with you, Kristen, that when you have a three day turnaround time, maybe, you know, but but every kennel, uh, the workload's gonna get intensive. And, and I will tell you now, the manager and the city staff and the council will not be thrilled with paying you know, 50 hours per week of, of washing. Just labor for washing. That doesn't work. So whatever solution we can come to, optimal. But I appreciate the consideration that's being given, and, you know, it has to be done. Whatever needs to be done. Well, well some of the clarification here that Crystal mentioned. Yes. I didn't understand that we were using our staff for washing. I thought that was coming out of the central pet budget, which we increased. So that's where I have some confusion still. Even if it's and coming out of their budget, about... it's diverting their workload. Yes, yeah. it yeah. is. That's my issue. They, they, they've assigned a certain level of people, so they may not have incorporated but, that. But I, I was making the assumption when we went to the board to increase their budget yeah. that those kinds of items were identified as part of their responsibility. Got it. And it, apparently it wasn't. Okay. So it was like it just an okay. amorphous contract without specifying hours per activity. Right, right, right. So, I'm learning that now through this discussion. Okay, that's yes, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, thank and you. Then, and then, too, on, uh, uh, if it, it is a fomite, I, I would never try to over, uh, uh, over right. you know, change the decision of our veterinary and yes, staff, but we haven't gotten that letter Correct. from them saying Correct. that. So I would expect that to this committee. Okay. So then if they want that support, they would have it. That's where I'm coming from. Understood. So, Christy Connors? Sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to respond that yeah, we're not looking to give every dog a princess pet. Okay. I mean, I know I'd love to do that. I wouldn't do that because there's nothing more fun than doing that. But, I mean, actually, I, I forgot. I, brought, I did a terrible little, you know, uh, collage of a bunch of, these are, these are what I would consider our most vulnerable pets. And you'll see, I didn't make enough for everybody, but, um, you know, the, the, all of those brown dogs are, are 14 years or older. Um, and, you know, the, the, Two of them are from very recent, and there was no blankets for them to be hacked in the laundry room anywhere. And no yoga mats yet. Um, you know, one of those, a couple of those are decompression dogs that, you know, the one with the little towel over his head, you know, is terrified without being covered up. You know, and that dog went out to foster, and once we got him out finally, but it took a long time. So these are these are the these are special cases. We're not asking to put a blanket in every dog, and we have to enforce that. I mean, it's volunteers, and I think it's not staff. I mean, it might be central pet so staff sometimes, but if volunteers are not following those rules and they're just giving every dog or a blanket, then we need to have somebody oversee that and enforce that. Um, and that's the hardest part. I and mean, even with central pet, you know, we talked about getting the clean, or leaving the clean and bedding in. That's just not happening with some of those staff. It's just not, and because we don't have certain people overseeing that. It, it so, so, uh, so I moved reform a uh, supplement to do as Christy had asked, which was to do some research and do open the dialogue. I'll second that. Or is that not what you're looking for? Um, <laughs>
motion's been moved and seconded first. Um, would you uh, question about the motion for discussion? Uh, how do, do you have any suggestion on how we might put together the committee? Um, we could add that to the motion. Well, if I could bring up a point of discussion, is, is, is a subcommittee something that works for what you're trying to do, or do you have a way that you would like to address this? It, with all respect, I do Absolutely. not believe a subcommittee is necessary for this issue. I, I think, again, this has not been treated like a life and death issue because it's not life and death, and we are working to keep a thousand, no, 1,400 animals alive every day. So um, I believe we have. I believe we're capable of managing this conversation outside of any subcommittee. I think we need subcommittees for things like um, the ordinances and um, standard operating procedures, but this I think is something we can manage. It's an operations issue and it's what you hired me for. That was going to be my comment. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's operations. Oh, well, I'll be mm -hmm. Well, that's your decision. Um, oh, we can. Um, I mean, I'm happy. What, what I've heard, what I've heard today is that I, it sounded to me that there's a reasonable middle road here for dealing with animals that really need this uh, versus uh, zero sum game, you know. Uh, and I think we could probably work this out. We just have to follow through on it and work it out. So I didn't make the motion. I can't withdraw the motion. I okay, I'll withdraw. It. But what I would like to do is be Wait, kept. She has to agree. No. I agree. <laughs> but I think I would like personally be kept in the loop. If there are blankets or thick yoga mats, if there's things, please use us as an outreach for any anything you need. Thank you. In our community. Thank you so much. Okay. So motion that was on the floor has been withdrawn, mm -hmm. and with the second of the. Uh, the second group. Okay. Second group. So there is no motion. Let it. Uh, just the director. Uh, there's been a discussion on this, and that the director will move forward with uh, working with key people to address the issue, and that we will follow up on it to see where things are. Yeah. May, may we request an update next month? Yes. On the issue. That'd be yes, great. Sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item. I'm going to jump to item E and the new business, phase two facility and construction update. Yay. All right. Yeah. Phase two. don't know me, my name is Marty Claude, I work with facilities, I think most people do, but there's some <laughs> guests here, so um, my role is I'm the, I'm an architect in Mid County, I'm the project manager that oversees the project um, through, throughout the entire process, phase one through phase two. Um, I'll run through this update on some of phase one and phase two, and then I'll get into this guillotine door issue, which could get long, but I'll try to, I'll try to reduce it. Um, so, quickly, I just want to talk about the solar energy project. You can see it's going on, it's cramping down in the parking a little bit, I think, but um, it's very exciting for PAC and the county and I think the community. Um, this system will generate 1.2 million kilowatt hours, which is about the equal to what PAC has used annually for the last five years or so. Um, and uh, it doesn't really what does that mean? That, you know, it's not that saving necessarily to the PAC or the county, but um, it is producing green energy and providing shade. Um, one of the things we did do that I mentioned last time, we tried to put canopies in places where we could benefit them besides shading the public supporters. Um, so we have this one here. We have some that are shading um, the, the enforcement group's vehicles. We do have a couple that are over play arts. Actually, we have and I have a slide that shows that later. We have about three or four that are over play yards, and we're looking at putting some others um, underneath the canopies, which had wait for them to be installed. Um, and here's some photos for those of you who haven't been around the site. So I'm going in. I was talking this morning. There's a, there's over 2,000 of these little these solar panels uh, that you can see out there. It's it's a big installation. It'll be completed in uh, midsummer, I believe. 
but here's one that they can put. It's it's just outside the player that Creator Good did, so it'll give it shade in the afternoon, which is nice. Play art. So I I heard some rumors on Facebook there was some complaints about play arts and shading. So I, I brought I just did the slide today. I don't know if anybody here has heard about any of that, but I, and we know there's a lack of play arts now. When I started here, the only play arts I had were, the, were these three between the park and the building. I put the I put the ones in that were um, sorry, can't point on there. I put these ones in when I first started on this project when the bond money was approved. But I want to show this next slide. This is the current play arts you have access to, so not very many, it's three, but this shows what you'll have when the project's done. So unfortunately with the planning, most of the play arts are in the phase two area. So um, we have a large play art that'll be completely shaded that's halfway through construction back here. There's the clinic play art, this is the greater good one. There's the existing and then there's even a, there's a meet and greet yard out here, um, actually dog introduction yard out front in the parking lot, so and dogs can be brought in um, that are already in homes and be introduced to uh, hopefully a future adopted dog. So, and of these, I think all but one don't have shade. So, some have partial shade, but so if that's a concern, I've heard from people as having shade players, I think they'll be pleased when phase two is complete. So, construction photos, more parking, you know, this is a problem. <laughs> so, this is the parking lot that's being built right now, and it connects to this parking lot. There's also more. Um, handicap accessible spaces, which are well exactly we double them. Um, this is showing the, the current parking is in orange here. The blue is all the new. That's great. So, wow. and what's nice is, so up by the tent will be converted into parking, and it's a little bit far, but the benefit over there is there's going to be shaded parking. So I think for those that are volunteering <laughs> for a longer period during the day, or an employee that is comfortable walking further, and maybe not getting off work late at night. Um, I certainly would park there for that shade benefit, especially during the summer. A lot of phase two, as you can tell, you just don't see much going on. You probably look in the dark holes and try to <laughs> see what's going on. Um, so I have a series of slides just showing what we're doing with the kennels. Um, so here's some photos of the existing um, layers of paint on them. So we moved all the chain link. They're cleaning them up, grinding out the metal. And you can see from these photos, there's holes all in the walls. You probably remember those too. So areas that are hard to clean and can collect bacteria. So they're going through and, and skim coating every concrete wall in there. It's, it's very laborious. And that is after they've power washed and sandblasted some of them. And then they're coating them with epoxy paint, which is similar to what you have in the, the new dog runs here in phase one. So here you can see what they've done. They, they have the main floor completely done at this point. Um, they painted out a lot of the ceiling, and they're starting to prep. As you can see, well, starting to prep the flooring here for the for the uh, cementitious urethane flooring, which is what you have in this building. And you can see here in the light shining on there how it's a nice seam surface, very easy to clean, um, and we'll hopefully do well with disease control and cleaning. Uh, the flooring is just starting, which is similar to what you have here, so that's in process now. You can probably smell it if you walk by. I don't know if anybody's been by. It's pretty nasty stuff. But once it hardens, it's wonderful. Is it kind of a rhino liner kind of thing? In a sense? Um, it's got like a texture to it. It, it does. So it builds up yeah. layers of, of urethane and then throw a flake down in it. Got it. And then coat it and it gives it that, that slip resistance. Good. Could you talk a little louder? It's a little bit louder? It's okay. I feel like I'm talking loud, but I don't uh, know. Um, okay. okay. So this is the front adoption room. Uh, and so while this was the best kenneling or some of, some of the better kenneling they had, it had some challenges too. It had all the holes in the walls still. And so we've gone in there and treated those as well. They sandblasted these. It had layers and layers of paint on it. I think in the renovation, they just recoated it instead of really coming back down to a clean substrate. So they sandblasted those down to bare concrete. And they're doing the same process. They're skim coating them. It's very laborious and expensive, but it's, and it's slow moving. So it doesn't seem like a lot of progress, but it's very important. Pretty much ready to paint those at this point. And Harry's Haven, while in much better shape, we've gone in there and they're repainting all those walls, cleaning it up as well. And they're cleaning up these. The stainless steel has years of just hardwire deposits and oil and grease. 
So we've got in there and cleaned those out. So they're wow. really, really good. So um, just letting you know, when that area is being looked at as well. This is the new entry. So this, this whole space here will be the life-saving operations group. So the offices are right on the front, pretty much the front door to phase two, which is nice. We'll give them a very visible public um, face there. These are in indoor meet and greet rooms, so their drywall is up. We'll be texturing and painting soon. The bathroom off the <coughs> floor in the front front adoptions <laughs> is being redone right now. So we get new tile and the finishes. All the ductwork. So we left some of the main pieces of ductwork, but we completely cleaned it. And I didn't see it myself, but I heard it had just shirt layers. It was not fun to clean out. But we went in there and, and got it all out of there and sanitized it, so it'll be nice and clean. This is the play our new player going at the front. So you can see all the walls are up and the, the steel before. These are shade canopies, not solar. So in addition to the solar, we have some shade canopies as well. This is the front, you can see off Silver Bell. Um, and this just shows how we're blending it in with the, the new building. So some of the window shades, covering up most of the red brick. And this is the back side. Um, here's that path to the tent so you can see these play arts. This is that play art that um, the, the gravel one with the shade can't be went in the wrong place and we had to move it. <laughs> so now it has a wall around it so it's a little more private from the dogs on this side. And then there's another play art that'll be in the back there that has a wall so it has some privacy as well. Okay, skylights in, in, <coughs> on the main floor so we can bring some natural light in. This is the volunteer break room that we recently change the design on the, to um, open it up a little more so they can have meetings in there and trainings in there since this is so busy. Um, but here's just some of the furniture. So you can see there's some workstations on the perimeter for Gina and Bonnie. And then, the, and then also the volunteers that are doing that type of data entry admin type stuff. And then they'll have um, just some tables in the center for uh, meetings or they could just be dispersed for um, people taking breaks. There's a little kitchenette there, um, and then it's right off the real life room that's planned for phase two. This is a photo of that looking into it now. So they've got the all the framing, the power, the data, the installations in, so it's ready for drywall. It's going to be a nice, nice uh, haven for uh, volunteers. That's on the construction. So, there's any questions? I do have a question. Yes. Um, I mentioned before that I worked at the Humane Society. And we had um, concrete, smooth kennels. They were, they were really, really old at the old facility. But you could see when a dog would lay down, the grease would get on the wall, and then there'd be the dirt, and it would be just really disgusting. So we went out and bought a power washer or a steam cleaner and used that to clean as often as we could to keep that, that thing from building up, that black stuff. What is, the, what is the solution for that? I mean. If you're talking about gross things that you're taking out now, they're going to come back if we don't figure out. They will. And, and to my knowledge, most of the cleaning that Central Pet does, I think, is sanit I mean, they pick up soil, soil, you know, waste, and they sanitize the paint. But it does not take down grease, which is in food and their bodies. And over time, it builds up. And really, the only solution is the power wash or going with soaps. Scrub it, yeah. yeah. I'd hate to see the new facility look yeah, and we have a far superior product than what those paints had over there. It's, it's um, I don't know if you touched in the, in the new building, very smooth and very durable. Um, I'm not sure what they put on at that time, but, yeah. but everything needs maintenance. You know, will not last forever. Well, on that vein, maybe we should, uh, yeah, as you continue, you know, have those discussions with you and staff about maybe having a once a year and you know, twice a year. And how about that in the future? Yeah. Yeah. That would be something we should have to do. Trans, you know, move dogs to other kennels or steam power washers or steam washers. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, is it still on schedule to be done in July? So, right as of now, we have a late June, late June. opening date. I'm not sure it's cemented yet, but that's what we, that's what Mary and I we met this week, and we're that's when it's expected to open up. And then after that, we will enter into what we call the phase 2B, 
or phase three is really just the tent removal and building up that parking lot area. Okay. It's a pretty short phase that it will come down quick. Okay. Are there any other questions in the I do. Yeah. What are you doing with the tent? Are you selling it? <laughs> we, we try, we try. Yeah, um, I, I believe the contractor has found somebody who will take it off their hands at no cost yeah. to, uh, and they're going to salvage some of the hardware pieces. Right. The membrane itself is probably past or added to usable life. Yeah. For, we, we've lucked out with the membrane. Yeah, especially the lower area really? that you're rotting. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We've lucked out. Lucked out. I just want to make a comment about the cleaning that was on that. When Central Tech cleans and they have they, they they squash the, the soap, they scrub the walls of the walls, and they see stuff it's on the great. walls, they have a scrub brush. They scrub those walls. I mean, they clean really well. It's, things aren't building up. If you walk through those kennels in the morning when they're cleaning, they really scrub. Good. That's great to hear. Yeah, and I mean, so if you see, it looked at the Harry's Haven photo, how old is That's nine years old? Yeah. It's mostly, I mean, it's hard water and I mean, a, it's not that bad. I mean, the main floor is fit over 50 years old, so yeah. I don't know how often it was coated. I doubt it was reapplied, maybe once at the most. Well, that, that's the new, the, the, what is it called? The, Are you saying? Right, that's the indoor outdoor kettle. Yes. Right. Well, those aren't very old. Nine years old. Mm, that's not, I mean, considering the rest of the facility. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to talk about the transfer doors a little bit? I'm here to separate. Sure. So I can get really, I probably will spiral down in depth, so just cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting late, so just so So late. just like 30 seconds on the history of it. When, when we programmed, the request was made to have indoor outdoor housing. The challenge we had was how do we heat and cool that? So in Harry's Haven, it all seemed fairly tolerable to you, right? They have been in there? Yeah. The AC ran 24 hours, pretty much. and. In the center portion where the human is, it's sat around mid 80s, low 80s. And that's with the AC running full blast. But when you take a temperature gun over to the kennel where the dog is, it's up into the high 80s and the 90s. So the reality is, what are we really trying to cool? The human or the dog? And that's a decision that is something we need to talk about. So we pushed back on Pat and said, can we evaporatively cool this building only? And we were told, we were given a big no. Okay, do you want to go away from indoor outdoor housing? No. So, what we have <coughs> is a hybrid system that will run even <coughs> cooling and AC. And so, days like today, ideally it should be running in evaporative mode only, and it's okay to leave those up. It's going to be a little bit warmer. I know some one area is a little bit warmer than I would expect. Uh, but I have a evap cooling in my house right now, and I have to shut it off at night. It's cold. So it works very well here. The challenge is in the monsoon months. And I think some of the perception is people think you got more cool and beat the tent. Those, those transfer doors can be left open all the time. Mm -hmm. There's just, just a consequence to it. It's energy. So it's something that Pat and I'm working on. We've been trying to meet. It just hasn't worked out. I'm trying to figure out what's, what's the win-win for the, those areas. And I, we have some ideas and some solutions. It's, they were never intended to keep the dogs, um, keep them down, keep the dogs inside for substantial periods. Um, my personal thought on it is that they're closed in extreme heat, especially when it's um, humid or extreme cold. Now with the cold, the, the, I mean the advantage here is we warm up during, on most days, we have maybe a, a dozen days where it's just really cold during the daytime. So opening them up during the day, even in the winter time, is really not a problem, and, and heating costs are lower. The whole issue with the red lights, it was really just meant to be a tool to let staff, volunteers know that, hey, it's, we're using more energy right now. It was never meant to be a, a, a guide to say, oh, it's on, let's shut them, it's off, because it goes on and off throughout the day. And so one of the things we're looking at is maybe widening the temperature range so they come on and off less or working with it somehow that way. But it was never really the intent there. But bottom line is the more they're open on a hot or cold day, the more Pat uses energy. On the flip side, the more they're closed, less pleasurable for the dog. And then the perception also of people is that, oh, they're in such a small space, which is not good either. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. It's not, it's, I think it's like some of your other issues. We're not there yet. We're still working on it. 
there's still things we're working on in the building with controls, trying to figure out are the lights coming on at the right time or not? Are they working properly? Is the system working properly? Is it staying in an evaporative mode at the right time? So there's a lot of little tweaks. That's a pretty complex system. But the other thing we looked at was they do make doors. The flap's not the right term, but they are basically a way to close them. It's like a saloon type door, I think, for those. We didn't install them because they're very expensive. I think we had a number of $40 million to put them on every one. Ooh. Which we could we could still look at or could have done. The problem, the, the issue I heard is they don't last. So it's one thing to spend a quarter million once. It's another thing to spend a quarter million every five years. And then the other thing is they have a lot of mechanical parts, and you can see even on even on the robust um, dog kennels, all the parts and pieces that just fall off and break, even though this stuff is supposed to be top of the line. So here you have a door with all of these bigger dogs. My fear would be that they don't last, and our shops are going to be out here daily fixing them. They're always going to be broken, and we spend a quarter million for not a lot of benefit. So that's kind of the nutshell. It's a short so we person. currently have a dual system in the new building. We actually have a system that runs. It runs three ways. It runs what's called indirect vapor cooling, which is a way of cooling the air without introducing water, and that's it was part of the reason it's so pricey. Then it'll kick into vapor cooling. When the dew point gets to a certain point, it recognizes it. That's when I go home in July, I have to manually go over and switch the AC because it's just wet inside. And it's like the tent feels. It switches, it turns off the evaporative cooling, it keeps the indirect evaporative cooling going, and it kicks on air conditioning. So, and it's just, it's just very expensive. I mean, you know your electric bill in the summer? It's doubles or triples. So, it's just finding that balance for pack. Shouldn't that increase the rate of return on the solar? Uh, you know, all the solar going in on these energy costs? No, because that's a set amount of power that, and we use it. We use it. Yeah, you have enough to, to it's balanced right now. With, with, they basically would be just covering the power that they need, but it's not going to be a savings. And like you're saying, it's, it's a trade off with, with doors. I mean, yeah, the flat doors. I'm going to say now, if I ran that back to our shop, they'd be like, what? No. I mean, that's well, you're just, talking about having... <laughs> that's a crazy cost. Uh, 150 of them? Well, I'm thinking about a happy dog that sees the flap open and goes, oh. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm like, I can play with that all day long. And, you know, it's good dog entertainment for a while, but that's going to get expensive. Um, and if the trade-off is simply just the energy efficiency, I think the point you're making is really valid. If there's a red light indicator, because I know God bless people, but if it's red, it's bad, and it's like a reflex, right? So, so if, if that's a question of training or education, maybe we need to look at that piece. And like yeah, and that's the second part. Yeah. So the first part was we were going to meet. I was going to meet with PAC as a, as a smaller group of management and try to figure out what what's a solution. And sure. then beyond that, there's some education. If we decide to use those, uh, it may just be a tool that staff says. Hey, around this time of the year, the lights on a lot. Right. We could also, as you know, we could trend all this stuff of computers now and figure out when's the best time to close them. Yeah. And not close them. Yeah, I kind of like that. You're talking. About. Sorry. Oh no, I just had a suggestion, and it's I don't know if it's anything that would interest you, but uh, we had uh, nothing but evaporative coolers for many years at the Humane Society. Then they got air conditioning, and the same thing. It was you could either use the AC or the coolers, and I'll tell you what, our bills went very high. Mm -hmm. So um, our operations manager came up with a, a solution that really made a big difference. He ordered a roll of clear plastic that was about that long and cut the pieces into you know, little flaps and then put holes in them and there was a little rack that would sit up. Now some of the dogs would chew them but you only have to replace one, not the whole door. And it made a big difference. The yeah. only problem that we had is a couple of dogs over the years would not it scared them. They wouldn't push through it. Right. You yeah, know, I've heard that a lot of them. Yeah, that was not a, a big deal. You know, we could, we could, we could, just yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> just a lot of people them all up. So, it, you know, I mean, if you have a dog that won't pull out the door, you could always take, you know, a couple of the flaps off. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's just a suggestion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Marty. Marty. All right. All um, right. Go home. Thank you. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm Item C. Uh, 
Tax strategic initiatives. I, I believe that uh, Kristen handed these out at the last meeting for your review, and uh, so we wanted to go back over them today and get any direction or feedback. Right yes, I handed them out last month, and we're gonna, except for Dr. Garcia, we're gonna create. And the thing that's going to come to you next is sort of a um, working mission statement as well. We really need that, and we need to do a stakeholder input process, but we really can't wait. I think we need a working mission that will, these strategic initiatives will sort of go underneath. They're a little bit like mission, vision, values. They're, um, we're going to create a one pager that has that mission and vision for you. Um, but this is really a starting point for us. And what I wanted, what what I mainly wanted to hear from you all today is: Is there anything that you either a really object to, it seems like a red flag, or b really doesn't make any sense? Well, for me, uh, the, dev, the uh, devil's in the details. These are great, uh, you know, general goals or whatever that we're stating it's what we do what do we mean by improved quality of care you know mm -hmm. so it's having that mission and you know your working group continuing to define you know like uh, action items or deliverables on each of those that they're yeah. working for each year or each quarter as we're going to get that's all yeah my thought was that these initiatives may actually be good good points for working groups right yeah. um, this may form our working groups yeah. and that those working groups may live on for a couple of years as we address issues within them sure. so that would be perfect yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, mr chair i mean that that was the big thing when you guys presented these to us the, the, you're establishing a clearly defined framework once again it's going with the transparency the things that we haven't had for the longest time this is helping set that base from which you build, and that's what we've asked you to do. So that's huge, and it's great. There's great basic information that will get flushed out as we go. So um, I think it's a good starting point, Barry. I think you're right with, with the you know building on it. What does it mean? Thank you. Anyone else? That was easy. Okay. So um, is the next step then to are, are you guys going to formulate mission? Um, yeah, so our operations team was asked, um, we have about 20 people on our operations, like managers, supervisors, all this, so we get together once a week. So their homework this week was to go find a mission and vision statement from an organization they admire, whether it's from animal welfare or not. I already, of course, in my head, like, have it in, in my brain what I think it should be, but we've asked the whole team to come back to us with their ideas. We're going to bring you next month a draft of a mission and vision statement to review. And then from there, we'll just create these working documents that we build out and eventually actually have a set of materials that define this organization. So these are the baby steps that get us there. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, there is nothing on old business today. Um, I actually moved it down to uh, future agenda items. Um, any announcements by the committee members? No. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, I did skip D. We had because we had it under strategic initiatives, which was. Uh, it's a no. super. It's a uh, super fast item. D. I mean, uh, rescue partner support protocol. Excuse me. I did skip that. Super quick. Okay. This is an information item. We, when I got here, what, what had happened is we're up to this like 88, 89% mark. We're treating the animals, but they're sitting here for weeks and sometimes months after treatment getting follow-up, very simple follow-up checks, staples removed. Some of them have to wait until they can get an eye surgery, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've done is to develop a draft protocol so that rescue partners who really are financially strapped can pull the animals sooner. We're saving them anyway, but it's costing us a lot. And so we want to incentivize our partner community who are all relying on donations to pull the animals sooner. So what we're proposing is to allow them to pull animals out that still have critical one-time medical needs, not ongoing things like diabetes, but one-time medical care, pull them quicker, and then allow them to come back for some very restricted follow-up care. Um, it will save us resources. It will save us money. Um, we're already saving the animals. and. We think it's a gesture of thanks to the to the partners who are saving the lives because in the end they're dealing with longer ongoing problems with these same animals, um, and so because it involves um, 
because it will involve PAC providing follow-up care for pets that are no longer in PAC's custody, Dr. Garcia and I wanted to bring it to the advisory committee uh, for awareness and any concerns um, that we can address. Yeah, did you hand it out to the draft protocol today? We did. I'm looking for it. And we've sent this to the partners, and they have requested a few other little things. So I mean, this this again is a working draft, but um, that I need to incorporate a few few things they've asked for. But um, Dr. Wilcox is the one who defined the parameters, um, and so she has um, defined what she thinks that pack that's we had to do and already doing. Could you elaborate a little bit on your comment that it's going to save us resources and why, why yeah. it's actually safe? Because we're, we're allowing animals that have gone out of foster to come back for medical treatment. Mm -hmm. So I, I could appreciate So that. we're already saving them. These are animals that we're already treating. They're, they're, they're animals in that 80 to 90 range. Um, the, what is costing us the most money is that they're sitting back in that clinic and our awesome. vets are, you know, they're here till 1130 at night um, on a busy day. So. This will allow us to continue to save those animals, but not to pay to house them for weeks or months while they wait to like get the staples out from a leg surgery or get an eye nucleation. They're just sitting here waiting for those things, costing us money. This will allow the partners to pull them, provide in foster care for mo most of the partners operate off foster homes while they wait to come back to get that follow-up procedure. Okay. So I also think what's important about this, if you guys read through this at your leisure, is that standardization of you know kind of what and how we're providing for all the foster rescue groups so that they're all on the same plane field yeah. and they all know what is what, what's allowed and what's expected okay. Okay. any other uh, comments on that or questions okay. I, I have one. Yeah. Um, would you explain to the committee and the audience about that two months Pets for Life, what their, what their goal is? Yeah, so um, I didn't really tell you they had it in Austin, um, <laughs> but they had a group called Austin Pets Alive, and they pulled the 3,000 most medically and behaviorally risk animals out of the shelter every year. They literally pulled them. Like, we didn't do surgeries for those animals. They were out the door. Um, and this community lacks a group that focuses on the last hardest animals. Um, and it's a challenge. The rescue groups here are amazing, but they are financially strapped. And, and so the Pets Alive model says that you pull what's still dying in the shelter. Um, and so uh, a new rescue group has come on the scene that brought some of this up that will pull just the animals that are still on the, the risk of dying list in there. Um, but what, what we kind of have learned through them forming is a lot of the groups came to us and said, but we want to help those animals too. We can't afford the follow-up care that's needed when we help those animals, so can you help us help them? So this document <laughs> came out of a conversation of how can we better provide support to partners to um, help them help these animals that really are the, the last ones that the most critical cases. Thank you. Um. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and move on to item nine then. Uh, are there any comments, announcements by the committee? Anyone? Uh, Christy, do you have any further Nothing comments to that? Um, the only one that I have today is, uh, it's been about two years since we uh, convened this new committee layout, and some of us have terms coming to an end this summer, in the next couple of months, and some of us don't. Some of us were appointed for four, some of us appointed for two. I wanted each of you to go back and look at where you stand, and uh, if you decide that you would like to continue to serve, maybe put that in a note to Kristen so that she has that, so that she can notify Dr. Garcia and can forward that to the board. Um, if you choose not to, let us know that too, so that we can uh, throw a party at this brute or something. <laughs> okay? Um, that's all I have today. And that's it. If there's nothing else, we'll call for a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Okay. Motion to adjourn the second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries.